OK, so last lecture, we developed the method of TTC, general time, trans time and transfer constant. We saw that we can actually calculate the transfer function and more importantly, building blocks of a transfer function independently. And that, those building blocks are perhaps more important than just aggregating them into one gigantic transfer function and looking at it. Yeah, great, what do you do with that? It actually gives it to you, the TTC gives, it, gives the transfer to you, function to you in a distilled fashion. So it's broken up into its ingredients so you can actually see what they are and what, what affects what. So we're going to do a couple more examples just to give you more, a better sense of these. And then we'll apply it to other circuitry that we use quite uh, frequently. So the next example we are going to use is basically this circuit. And then there's a reason. So this is another example. And this circuit you've seen in one of your problem sets. So we have this cross-coupled, so-called the cross-coupled pair, where you have two transistors, let's say two MOSFETs. The gate of one is connected to the drain of the other one, and vice versa. Right? You probably remember this circuit. This had an interesting property. And if you write the you know, KVL, KCL from low frequency perspective, you can see that actually the impedance seen looking here is a negative impedance, negative resistance, in fact. right? If you look at this negative resistance, the resistance was negative 2 over GM, differentially. And it's very easy to show if you just write the KCL and KVL and apply one voltage to the other. Or, or equivalently, you can say the conductance of this thing is negative GM over 2. Right? So th this is something we already know. I mean, if you don't, we can just derive it again. But the next thing is that now let's add, we've, we add a couple of reactive elements to this. So we add a, an, uh, let's say, a capacitor. And we add an inductor, L, capacitor C, and a, let's say, a resistance to represent the loss or a conductance to represent the loss of this inductor and capacitor. Because the way we are showing them is like some ideal inductor and some ideal capacitance. So this makes it not ideal. The question is, what is the impedance seen looking into this thing? And the way to evaluate it, how do you, if you are really looking for impedance, what is impedance? Impedan impedance is also another transfer function, right? What is the input to that transfer function? A current, right? Because that's in the denominator. The current of a port. And what's its output? A voltage. So the input has to be a current source. And you will see this matters. If you actually are trying to calculate impedance and you use a voltage source there, say, well, it doesn't matter. It's a ratio of the voltage to current. Then what happens is that can change the time constants that you see. So as long as you keep it consistent, say, well, I'm calculating impedance, therefore my input, my stimulus, is a current. Or if I'm calculating an admittance, my stimulus is a voltage, everything will work out as it's expected. So, so let's say this is I in, right? And we are looking at determining V out. And the ratio of V out, so Zs, the impedance, is the ratio of V out over I in, the output to the input. So this is what we are trying to calculate and see how it goes. But let's do it with, a with the time and transfer constants. The reason for doing this particular one with time and transfer constant is to show that actually it works for circuits that are, in principle, can be unstable too. So it's not limited to stable circuits. So it's an example. So let's do that. Let's calculate these time and transfer constants. So let's start with the transfer constants, right? So what is... Um, Z naught. Instead of H naught, I'm writing Z naught because it's the, the transfer constant is basically a, an impedance. So what is Z naught? Z naught is where all the elements are zero valued, right? So if all the elements are zero valued, this is open and this is a short. So you're driving a current into a short. What is the voltage? Zero. So what is the Z naught? Zero. Now what is Z uh, let's say L, or let's say ZC first. Let's say ZC. Do the ZC first. What is ZC? Again, zero, because ZC means that C is infinite value. Basically, both of them are shorted now. An inductor is zero open value, so they have two shorts in parallel. 
So that's still 0. And then ZCL, ZLC, I guess, is also 0 because, yes, L is open, but C is still shorted. So that's also 0. So the only non zero one is ZL. So when is ZL? What is ZL? Z, in, in the case of ZL, L is infinite valued, so it's open circuit. C is Z, zero, uh, uh, zero valued, which is also open circuit, right? So they're both open circuits. So now you will actually see whatever you see here. And that's a trivial impedance calculation, right? Because it's this impedance in parallel, in differ differentially, in parallel with this impedance, right? And now you're talking about two conductances in parallel, which what, what do they do when two conductances are in parallel? They add, right? So this is going to be negative gm over 2 from this part plus go. Yes? Is it one over that? Yes, it is one over that. Thank you. Thank you. gm over 2 plus go. That would be the conductance. But, and this is the resistance that you see. That's correct. Thank you. Um, now, it's, so that, those are the transfer constants. And now we need to also calculate the time constants, right? And we're done. It's at that point, at least practice. And as far as I'm concerned, we're done. But then you can put it together and write the full impedance and transfer constant, the transfer function and see what it looks like. But anyway, so what are the transfer constants? So, uh, time constants, sorry. Tau C0, there are two zero value time constants, tau C0 and tau L0, right? What is tau C0? Tau C0 is the resistance, is C times the resistance that is seen by the capacitor when all the, well, no, all the other elements are zero value. If this is zero value, what resistance do you see? Zero, right? So this is C times zero, so you might as well write zero. So then the other thing, now about tau L. What is the resistance seen by inductor? when c is zero value. You see this thing, right? So let's give this a name. We can, we can define, uh, let's define gm over 2 minus g0 as g effective. Or, well, let's call it negative of that g effect. Uh, I, can't, I keep changing my mind. OK, let's, let's keep it this way, because then you will see something more effective. This is really. What I'm trying to make is that to make this is a positive quantity generally. We'll see. I mean, it depends, of course, on the values of these things. Um, but OK, so tau L0 is basically L over this, which would give you essentially n n L, negative L, or, or, or negative L times G effective, right? Because it's L over that resistance which you can write as L times negative gm over 2 plus g0. Make sense? Because it's an L over R, so it becomes L times g. And now, there's one more we need to calculate. So which one would you calculate? Would you calculate tau CL or would you calculate tau LC from, by looking at these? Tau CL, why? That's correct, yes. Why would you pick tau CL? Yeah, because you will end up otherwise, if, if this is 0, there's a good chance that if it's a finite value, the other one will become infinity. And we'll see, see it. We'll do it both. Do, do both. So, but the, the, in, the correct is you need one of the two, but you really want to calculate the one associated with this, which would be tau CL. Because what is in the sub, sub, subscript goes into the superscript for the next one. Now, what is that? Well, that's the resistance seen by the capacitor when the inductor is infinite valued, which is basically open, which is again what? It's this conductance, right? So it's basically C over negative GM over 2 plus um, GO. You can write it as negative C over G effective. And just for completeness, what is tau? LC, I'm just to, so you guys can see that that becomes infinity. Well, the resistance seen by L when C goes to infinity, becomes infinite value. So it's a short, right? So that resistance is zero. But the time constant associated with an inductor is L over that resistance. It's L over R. So it becomes L over zero, 
So it's infinity. So that, so yeah, and then you can multiply them and you can say zero times L over zero is L. No, you can't. Uh, this, so this goes to infinity. Uh, okay, so here's the thing. So you have these, and then we are essentially done. But let's calculate, actually write down the transfer function. What is the transfer function? So the terms of the transfer function are, if you want to do the a's and b's, a0 is 0, right? Because zl is 0, z0 is 0. Z, a1 is the sum of these two. So it's non-zero. It's basically zl. Um, right? Times the time constant associated as ZL times tau L0. And you can see that these two terms cancel. So it's tau L0. And these two terms cancel. So what you're left with is just L. So it's L. A1 is L, right? Because it was, if you remember, A1 was sigma tau I0 HI. And then A2 is, again, 0 because this guy is 0. So that's 0. Now, B1 is the sum of the 0 value time constants. So it's this thing. So it's negative L G effective. And B2 is the product of these two, which where, again, these two guys cancel. You have basically LC. And if you really insist on writing the transfer function itself, yes, you can. You just basically plug these things in. You get basically Ls over 1 plus, or 1 minus, rather, negative Lg effective S plus Lc S squared. OK? So, but what does that tell us? Let's see. I mean, this is just calculation. This is math. We have to see what. We learn from this. So what can we do with this kind of topology or circuit? What does it look like? If that middle term was not there, right? what kind of response is this? What kind of circuit? What, what is this thing? It's a resonator, right? It's a lossless resonator. It's, a sec it's like an LC. It's like an ideal LC. Right? If you put some energy in it, it would go keep going forever. Now, what else can you tell? So now, if that term, so, so uh, you remember I defined GEF to G effective to be positive. So let's say, if, assuming GM, so we can make G effective negative or positive. Let's say if G effective, if this whole term was positive, meaning that G effective was negative, or meaning that GM over 2 is smaller than G, G naught, right? If, if this, the effect of this thing is weak, Let's say GM is 0. Let's say GM is 0 for time, time, time being, right? If GM is 0, this thing is positive, right? G effective becomes negative, so this coefficient becomes positive because G effective is negative itself, right? So what does that look like? What kind of response is it? So, so let's look at values of GM. So we are looking at a case where um, GM over 2 is smaller than, let's, let's say, GM, of, GM is 0, or more accurately, GM over 2, or G, more generally, GM over 2, which would include that, is smaller, is smaller than um, G0. That would also include GM being 0. In those cases, this is a, over, this is a damped system, right? Because this is also negative now. So minus negative times negative becomes positive. So it's a damped response. If you look at the impulse response or you put some energy into it, you will get something like this. Okay. Now, what would you get if GM is exactly, GM over 2 is exactly equal to G0? Right? If GM over 2 is exactly G0. In that case, it's basically this term disappears. This term disappears. And what happens is that your impulse response would be a sustained sinusoid. 
right? It will neither decay nor grow, right? Because it's basically just you don't have a loss term. You don't have a damping term, if you will. Now, now what happens if GM over 2 is greater than G0? Now look at that. And you know what happens, right? In that case, G effective, the way we've defined it, will be positive. So this term is negative. So you not only don't have damping, you actually have growth. You have gain. So what happens here is that you hit it with an impulse, and then this thing will grow. So if you actually built this circuit, what do you think it will do? I mean, this doesn't show biasing. You need to show, have some biasing, right? I mean, of course, you have to have some current. So you can put a middle point in the inductor or something like that to provide the biasing, because otherwise there's no path for DC current. But there has to be some mechanism or two current sources going into the thing. But what would it do? What is it doing? What, what happens if you actually build the circuit and set the GM, square, GM over 2 greater than G0? Right? It's something that's possible to do, generally speaking. So what would happen? Would the universe blow up? <laughs> because just like this keeps growing. So what happens? What happens in reality if you go in the lab and build this, or make a chip that has this on it? So yeah, it will, it will be something that will limit it exactly, right? I mean, so and, and there will be could be diff, there are different li limiting mechanisms that can kick in depending on how much current you have available to you or what the voltages are and the breakdown. So at some point, it will start saturating. One of the, the ways that it can saturate is that if you really think about it, as the amplitude increases, the current is fluctuating more and more, right? Now, the, the assumption of a constant GM constancy really goes back to the assumption of small signal behavior, which really goes back to the fact that you're assuming that your current is constant around a certain operation point. The more you deviate from that, the more dynamically your GM is changing, right? So your effective GM, and there's a way to actually define this precisely and calculate it accurately, we call it actually capital GM, um, large signal trans effective transconductance, which is used basically, it's based on describing function analysis. If you want to look, look that up. Um, describing function analysis allows you to calculate a GM for a given amplitude, but it becomes an amplitude dependent GM, capital GM. As the amplitude increases, that GM starts actually becoming smaller. If you act, when you look at that GM, that capital GM, which I haven't really told you what, ex how exactly it's defined, the large signal effective GM, versus amplitude, at very small amplitude, it's GM. It's lowercase GM. And as it increases, it beha behaves like this. As the amplitude increases, it generally behaves like that. And you can write expressions that describe this and all those things. Now, so what would happen? As the amplitude starts growing, let's say you start from a very small amplitude. Let's say you start from noise. You have noise in the circuit, right? We haven't formally talked about it. We will ext talk extensively about noise in the circuit. But you have some noise or perturbation or something. There's a little deviation. It starts growing, right? It keeps growing. But as it's growing, the amplitude, uh, the, the GM, starts becoming smaller and smaller. Up to what point? Exactly, until GM over 2, the capital GM over 2 becomes GO. And at that point, basically your, your, growth, I mean your rate of growth is 0. So the circuit naturally stabilizes around that. Now, this is interesting. There is stability over instability. So your instability is stabilized by this nonlinear behavior. It's called orbital stability. Because if you look at it in, in the state space, for example, look at the current, and, current of the inductor and voltage of the capacitor, it looks like you're going through a closed trajectory. You have an, you have, and we call it a stable orbit, because if you deviate it from that orbit, so if you look at I of inductor and V of the capacitor, it would be going like that. But if you deviate it from this, it will eventually come back to this. And if you deviate it in this direction, it will eventually come back to it. And when we talk about stability, we'll talk about some of the conditions that will lead or not lead to this, if you want to induce this or not. The other way to think about this is actually in terms of poles and zeros. 
So here's another, I'm trying to fit everything on white, one whiteboard, and that's probably asking too much. Well, it is asking too much. Let's use another one. So here's another in terms of poles and zeros, right? So look at the sigma and j omega plane, the s plane. So in the s plane, when you're starting off in the case where gm was smaller, gm over 2 was smaller than g effective, the case where it was a, the, the, the total system was a damping system, it had loss, right? Where are the poles in the denominator? You can see that there are two poles, right? The poles are complex in that case. Are they left half plane or right half plane? Left half plane. So, so those poles well, are somewhere here. And they're a complex conjugate pair. And you have a 0 at 0, if you really want to kind of like think about that. But that's because of the numerator, right? But now if, so I should write that basically on this side, gm over 2 smaller than g effect. So when you start from the other scenario, where the opposite is true, then your denominator term is a, has a negative second order term, first order term, like B1. So it's a growing term. Yes? Isn't it gm over 2 smaller than g0? Yes, correct. Thank you. G, not g effective. g, 0. Thank you. Thank you for the correction. Yes. So yes, that's the condition. g effective is the com combination of the two. In other words, saying g effective is greater than 0 or g effective is smaller than 0. That's what these things mean. So in those cases, in this case, basically you have a pair of complex conjugate poles that are on the right half plane, right? Because b1 is negative. Now what happens as the amplitude grows because of this nonlinear behavior of the capital GM, the effective GM, which we haven't formally talked about, starting from GM and going down, what happens is that this pole starts moving, right? As the amplitude grows, GM drops, so this becomes smaller, right? So it gets closer and closer to the condition of GM over 2 being equal to G0. So they start moving. So the poles start moving as the amplitude grows. So this is as the amplitude grows. And then at some point, so they will they usually kind of do this a little bit. And at some point, they hit the j omega axis, right? At some amplitude. And that, that amplitude, the stable oscillator, and that's why you get a stable oscillation. Stable oscillation meaning that the amplitude is stable, it doesn't grow or decay. And what happens is that if you, if you deviate it, if so, all of a sudden you try to just reduce the amplitude, you just short circuit it for a second with some resistor and try to drop the amplitude, it goes back here, but then, then it moves this way because now you have this condition, so the amplitude grows till it gets there. And if your amplitude increases for some reason, some perturbation increases your amplitude, then it goes into this region where it becomes decaying and it comes back in. You can see that there's some self-stabilizing mechanism. This is how oscillators are built, or one of the ways that oscillators are built, at least. So this stabilization happens uh, in the system. Now, the other thing that is interesting, if I had given you this curve, can you predict something else about this oscillator? First of all, can we predict the frequency of oscillation from this? Right? The frequency of oscillation at the os point of oscillation is going to be omega is 1 over square root of LC, right, from that transfer function, because that middle term just goes away. But can you predict something else? If I had given you that purple curve on the left, that capital GM, the effective GM versus amplitude, about the oscillator, another property of the oscillator in steady state. We predicted its frequency. Can we predict something else about it? Amplitude. Amplitude. How would we predict that? Because at this point, when it's stabilized, GM has to be 2G0. 
So if I set, if I calculate, well, or more accurately, GM, capital G. So if I set my capital GM to, to G0 and then find out when it crosses, that would give me the amplitude of oscillation. So this kind of analysis not, can not only predict the frequency, but it can actually predict the steady state amplitude. And you can see if, for example, before things start saturating or something like that, the transistors, as long as they are remaining in this region, you can see it actually you can, by controlling G0 and the baseline of GM, you can actually control the amplitude of the oscillator. You can design it for you. Of course, there are fluctuations and things like that. So, yes? Um, why is it capital G? Why is it capital GM or what, what is capital GM? What is capital GM? So, ca okay, so, so let's go to what capital GM is. Um, it's, it's a good question. I, I threw something at you that we hadn't discussed, so that's fair. So these are called describing functions. So capital GM is this. So we say, let's say you have a nonlinear system. So this is now nonlinear. And let's say you drive it with some sort of a sinusoidal input at some frequency, omega naught and an amplitude A, A1. So the input is really A1 cosine of omega zero T going in. And then of course, this being a nonlinear system, it would produce some funky looking, well, it should be periodic if it's memoryless nonlinear. Um, and even if it's non-memory, even if it's memory, if it's going on for a long time, it would. So let's say it produces some, okay. I have to be a little bit more careful with this produces something like this, periodic with the same period, fundamental, but it will have harmonics, right? It will produce something. So, but if I have a tuned circuit, let's say I have a perfect filter at omega naught, I have a perfect notch at omega naught, what would come out is what? What would come out? It's only a fundamental with some gain, right? So I will get some A2 cosine of omega zero T plus possibly some phi, phi, right? Some phase, some phase shift. So GM is the ratio of the output, capital GM is the ratio of the output current or the fundamental of the output current to the fundamental of the input voltage of a transistor, capital GM. So it's the ratio of the amplitude of the fundamental to the fundamental. And in fact, you can think about it as a complex quantity because it also has phase, right, in general. It's amplitude and phase, right, in polar coordinates. It's real and imaginary in Cartesian. Um, okay, so the ratio of these two is basically called the describing function. Well, this is the fundamental describing function. You can actually have describing function for, well, I should call this actually A0. I should call this A1. So A1 to A0 is the fundamental term with the phase phi, is the fundamental describing function. And then there's A2 over A0, which is the describing function for the second harmonic. And so on and so forth. So GM is that for the current to the voltage ratio of a transistor. Because, of course, it becomes nonlinear, right? It starts clipping, things of that, so the current is not going to be exactly sinusoidal if you drive it with a sinusoidal voltage. But as you do that, and it, can off, it depends even on the operation point, so it, it's valued. But as you do that, you will see that the, comp the fraction of the output that's in the fundamental drops, and that's what capital GM really is. Does it make sense? Again, if you're looking, if you're more, more interested in this a deep, more dis detailed descri this description of this thing, look under the uh, describing function analysis. Okay, any more questions on this example? So, yes? For that one? Yeah, okay. What are we trying to calculate? What did we say we are trying to calculate? I should have said that here too. This is ZS. This is the impedance, right? What's the definition of the impedance and impedance? 
voltage over current. But in a transfer function, numerator is the output, the denominator is the input. So now, if I were trying to calculate an admittance, then I should have driven this with a voltage source, V in, and calculated I out. And you may say, what is the difference? The difference is that the time constants they produce are different. Because one of them short circuits, one of them open circuits, when it's nulled. And I'll show you examples of that as we go through. Um, OK, so that's one example. Let's do one more example. And uh, so here's one more example just of the generalized time and transfer constants, just to get a little bit more comfortable with them. OK, our second example is where we have an input voltage source with a source resistance R that goes to a capacitor C1, an inductor L2 to ground, and L3, in inductor L3, driving a load resistor of also set value R. So this is V out. And we are interested in finding this transfer function. First of all, before we do that, let's do some initial study. I mean, it's a good practice, good practice to not jump into anything right away. And this is true about things other than circuits. Just look at it a little bit, study it. See, you can see what it looks like from this angle, looks from this angle, looks from the top. Yeah, see what's happening. Am I jumping into this thing or not? What is underneath me, right, when I'm jumping into things? Uh, OK. So how many poles, how many zeros do we expect? Three poles. Three poles, right? Be why three poles? Because I can define three initial conditions. If, for example, I can set the voltage of this capacitor to be one volt, the current of this inductor to be two volts, and the current of this inductor to be 759 volts. No, no, sorry, two amps and 759 amps, right? So, and nothing will break. Now, if this capacitor was an in, were also an inductor, how many poles would I get? Two, right? Because if I set the current of this capacitor to be one, or that in, in, inductor that would replace it by one amp, and the current of this guy to be two amp, let's say both going in this direction, I cannot set this current to be 759 amps. It can only be three amps, right? So then I have one fewer degree of freedom. The same thing, what, what capacitive loops do, the same thing happens with purely inductive nodes. If you have a purely inductive node, it reduces the degrees of freedom by one. What I mean by purely inductive node means that a node that only where only inductors are connected to it. If there's one extra element and one resistor attached to it, then it's not a purely inductive node. More accurately, it's a purely inductive cut set, meaning you can define a topological cut set that allows you to kind of like have only inductor currents. But anyway, um, so three poles, correct. How many zeros? OK, great. Two. That is correct. Why? Right, right. The, the, the maximum number of elements that can be simultaneously infinite valued, right? And this can be infinite valued to be open, and this can be infinite valued to be shorted to produce two zeros. And get non-zero transfer function. OK, so that's good. So we know we have two zeros and three poles. So we know everything about this. Is it a low pass, high pass, band pass, no pass, all pass? So what is it? Is it, a, is it a low pass? No, because this capacitor kills DC, right? Doesn't let low frequency stuff go through. Is it a high pass? No, because this inductor will kill the high frequency stuff. Is it a band pass, possibly? Depends on where the poles and zeros are. So, so it's kind of like we have to look at that. OK, good. All right, so let's do the TTCs. The transfer constants, or time constants, either way, we can do one or the other first. Uh, so we know we are going to go to the third order. So let's do the transfer constants first. H0, where all the elements are zero valued. What, what is the V out to V in? Well, if this is zero valued, nothing goes past this guy, right? So this is zero. H, um, let's use the indices, right? So H1 for the capacitor. What is that? Does anything go through? No, because this guy will short circuit it still. Right? So that's zero. H2. 
This is zero value, still doesn't go anything go through because the capacitor is open. H3, new infinite value, this one, still nothing goes through because this capacitor is there. So H12, H12, what happens? Both of them are zero valued, infinite valued. This is shorted, this is opened. And now this is still shorted. This, I'm sorry, yes, because it's zero valued. So what is that H12? One half. one half. It's R divided by R plus R, it's one half. What is H13? One and three. This is shorted, this is opened. So it's zero. H23, still zero because the capacitor blocks it. And there's the H123. You see, these are like, if you, once you get used to them, they're pretty easy to calculate. Actually, you may not even need to write all of them down because you can say, well, the only one that's non zero is this thing, right? Um, H123 is zero or not? Zero, zero because this one shorts. Uh, sorry. Um, this, is, this is open. So wait a second. No, no. L3 is open. Yes, that's right. That's why it's zero. OK, so we are done with the transfer constants. Now, the time constants, so there's a tau 1, 0. What is tau 1, 0? This guy, what's the resistance seen by this? And of course, the source is nulled. The source in this case is a voltage source, so it would be shorted. What does this guy see when, I, when these guys are, this is short, this is short, right? They are all zero valued. So this is a short to ground on this side. What do you see? Just R, RC, right? Just R, right? I'm sorry, so it's R. C1 or RC. Just one C, so I'll call it C. And tau 2, 0, what is the resistance seen by this guy when this is open, this is short because these are zero valued? Again, R, right? So it's L over R, L2 over R. And tau 3, 0, this is short, R, so it's L3 over R, right? So these are done. Um, then you need three of the other combinations. You don't need all of them. There are six combinations, but you need only three of them. You need to pair them up properly. Right? So you can actually calculate, uh, it, it doesn't matter. It's like, oh. So you can define, t so, so if you want to go by the indices, you, what, you, so what is the B2 term? Let's write the B2 term first to see what we need. B2 is the double sum of i and j, r is smaller than j, of tau i0, tau j i, right? So it's, for example, tau 1, 0, tau 2, 1, plus tau 1, 0, tau 3, 1, plus tau 2, uh, 0, tau 3, 2. There are different combinations of this thing. There are other combinations that you can use. Right? It's not limited to that, because you can change the indices and switch the indices, so it's not sensitive to that. But if you want to go exactly by these indices, what are the things that we need? So we need a tau 2, 1. Tau 2, 1. The resistance seems by this guy when this is infinite valued. Right? This is shorted. This is shorted. So what do you see? You see the two r's in parallel, right? You see one r to the left, one r to the right. So it's going to be L2 divided by uh, r over 2. Tau 3, what do else do we need? 3, 1. This isn't seen by this guy when this is infinite valued. OK, so this is infinite valued, but this is still 0 value. So this is short. It doesn't matter what happens after that. So it's still r. So it's L3 over r. And tau, what do we need? 3, 2 is what? 3 when 2 is infinite valued. So this is infinite valued. What do we see? What's the resistance? What, resistance, what, is, what is the resistance seen by this guy when 2 is infinite valued and 1 is 0 valued? No. When this is 0 valued, this is open, right? When this is infinite valued, this is open too. So it's on this side, it's open. So if you're open on one side, what's the resistance you see? Infinity. But the time constant for an inductor is L3 divided by that resistance. So what is the time constant? It's L3 divided by infinity. Or I should put the quotation here. So which is 0. 
OK. We need one more time constant. Right? What is B3? It's tau 1, 0, tau 2, 1, tau 3, 1, 2, right? We need tau 3, 1, 2, for example. What is tau 3, 1, 2? The resistance seen by this guy when both of these guys are infinite valued. This is infinite valued, what happens? Shorted. This is infinite valued, this is open. So this doesn't exist, this is shorted. So now, 2R, right? So that guy, tau 3, 1, 2, is L3 over 2R. So this is the transfer function, right? I mean, you can just plug them in and get some things. If you do, this is what you will get. I mean, just for the heck of writing it down, to, if that bothers somebody. I don't think it should, but sometimes it does. Sometimes things that should not bother you bother you. But it's only as for, it will only last as long as you think it matters. So if you realize that something doesn't really matter, then it stops bothering you. OK. That's a transfer form. It's in your handouts. Um, OK. So this demonstrates that you can actually do calculations. And we'll do more calculations with the higher time constants. But this is what it is, right? Any questions about this exa these examples? All right. 